Are two small islands in the Red Sea owned by Egypt or Saudi Arabia? A territorial dispute causing more heated debate in Cairo. That's where the president's accused of betrayal. What's the real story behind what some describe as a sell-off? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Darin Abu Geida. It's a highly contentious issue in Egypt. The small islands of Sanafir and Tiran in the Red Sea owned by Egypt or Saudi Arabia. So they're located between the two countries and considered strategically important because of their proximity to ports in Jordan and Israel. So after months of debate and protests in Cairo, the territorial dispute is back in the parliamentary spotlight. A committee of Egyptian MPs has approved an agreement to hand over control of the island to Saudi Arabia, despite the high administrative court in January declaring that plan unconstitutional. So Sunday's latest discussion in parliament was heated, as you can see. Representatives argued whether the debate itself was appropriate because of the court's ruling. Government supporters say the courts have no authority on the ownership decision. So the confusion about who owns the islands dates back to 1950. That's when Egypt took control of the islands. Government supporters say that was meant to be temporary so Egypt could protect the islands on behalf of Saudi Arabia. Four years later, Egypt told the UN Security Council that the islands had been under Egyptian control for decades. It took 30 years for Saudi Arabia to petition the UN, saying it owned the islands. Then last year, Egypt and Saudi Arabia signed an agreement putting the two islands under Saudi Arabian control. They say they were negotiating that deal for six years. Protesters in Egypt say President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is selling the islands to Saudi Arabia in exchange for billions of dollars of investments and loans. So, as we just mentioned, Egypt started to assert its control over the Tehran and Sanafir Islands in the 1950s. Here's what the then president said at the time. The Gulf of Aqaba is an Egyptian land. The width of the Gulf is less than three miles and is located between Sinai Coast and Tehran Island. Both Tehran Island and Sinai Coasts are Egyptian. If we said the territorial waters, is three miles, then it is Egyptian territorial waters. And if we said it is six miles, it is Egyptian territorial waters. If we said it is 12 miles, then it is Egyptian territorial waters. Let's now get the thoughts of our guests. Joining us here in the studio, we have Yahya Ghanem. He's Al Jazeera's Middle East analyst in Cairo via Skype. Timothy Caldas, he's a non-resident fellow at TIMEP. That's a policy institute focusing on policy analysis in the Middle East. Welcome to you all. Timothy, start with you. You're talking to us from Cairo. It is just astounding, the controversy surrounding uh, these two islands. And, and we saw the chaotic scenes coming out of Parliament. Tell us why you think Egyptians are so angry. Well, this is undoubtedly the least popular decision, politically at least, that uh, that CC has taken since he became president in uh, 2014. Uh, historically, Egyptians have been raised on a pretty healthy diet of uh, of uh, military nationalism, and uh, the sanctity of land in Egypt is something that's emphasized throughout the school curriculum, throughout uh, state media, and uh, as part of the of the nationalist narrative in Egypt. And so, the idea that this territory would be handed over to another country is extremely controversial, and many of Sisi's own supporters have been uh, against the move, some quite vocally. Uh, I would add that many Egyptian families have lost loved ones in wars uh, that they believed were fought over uh, the land in Sinai, including Tehran and Senefir. So there's a lot of emotion behind that as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, I suppose the most important question right now is, is that debate in Parliament appropriate in itself? Is it supposed to be held in light of that court ruling we saw in January that annulled the decision to hand over the islands? Definitely not. Definitely not. I, I believe that the Parliament uh, had no right and have no right uh, to, uh, to, uh, to take any decision over that, uh, that uh, treaty. Uh, I believe that the, the court ruling uh, just took away uh, uh, the right of anybody in Egypt to discuss this uh, potential treaty at all. 
I mean, it annulled the ruling, the court ruling annulled the, uh, the, the, that, that draft treaty. But from your so, knowledge, is there any legal perspective that Parliament has? From what legal perspective no, does Parliament no, no, have no. coming from no, uh, according to the Constitution? The right. No. The Parliament has no right to discuss and to review a, a, a draft treaty that was annulled by the, the highest court uh, in Egypt uh, uh, ruling. So it's, it's against the law. It's Timothy, illegitimate. Timothy, we also understand that the Parliamentary Media Committee didn't send out uh, what's known as their weekly committee meeting agenda to media outlets. So what does this tell us about the, uh, the spirit, the atmosphere in which this parliamentary session is being held? It seems to be somewhat shrouded in secrecy, at least from the media. It's less an issue of secrecy and more an issue of nobody wanting to be politically exposed. So, I mean, everyone knows this is being debated in Parliament. This is that's very public. Uh, the issue is the parliamentarians who are going, if they're going to go and vote for uh, approving this treaty, they don't necessarily want their names to be publicly attached to it. So, a lot of parliamentarians had requested, for example, that it be a voice vote in which names are not recorded uh, to avoid being publicly tied to supporting this transfer. Um, with respect to the legality of discussing this in Parliament versus the courts versus a, a presidential uh, prerogative, that, that rests partly on determining whether or not these islands are sovereign Egyptian territory versus protectorate. And that's where the, the, the government is arguing that since it's not actually sovereign territory and a protectorate, that it, that it does not require a referendum. If it was sovereign Egyptian territory, the transfer of the land would require a referendum, uh, which the government is refusing to conduct obviously in part because this is an extremely unpopular uh, proposal. Um, and so the, the, that's where the court's role comes in, in terms of trying to determine whether or not this is a violation of the constitutional uh, procedure. And Yahya, yeah, I guess that is the fundamental issue here. It all comes down to sovereignty. Who owns these islands? That's a big question. Well, uh, Egypt has always had the sovereignty over uh, these two islands, along with some other islands, smaller islands in, the, in that area. And this is, uh, uh, this, this is a fact. I mean, nobody can challenge this fact. Uh, uh, in the intro, you mentioned something about the, that Egypt assumed sovereignty and control over the, uh, Egypt the two took islands control, in Egypt the took 50s. control, yes, that's this right, from wrong. Saudi Arabia. This is wrong, this is not can right. Can you clarify that then? Of course, this is not right. Egypt has had control Actually. over over the two islands, over the two islands long before that. Let me just clarify a thing. Something. I mean, the the two islands have become officially part and part of Egypt uh, uh, in two uh, in 1906, uh, when the Ottoman, which was the the, the state sovereign over both Al Hijaz later, uh, 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 which became later a part of Saudi Arabia, uh, and Egypt, uh, the Ottoman Empire recognized the two islands as part of Egypt's territories. So, and that is official. And we've got the documents in Egypt, in Istanbul, they're everywhere. But the fact is that the government doesn't want to show these documents and the government controls all these documents. Okay, hang on one second, because Timothy, I know you wanted to interject, especially when Yahya was saying that, uh, talking about the 1950s and what happened then? I think it's just a little bit more complicated than that. Look, I, there, Egypt definitely has a reasonable argument that it's been sovereign, of, that it holds sovereignty over those territories. And I don't really, for me, the fundamental issue has less to do with that and more to do with the procedure of how this is being done and the constitutionality of the process. But there are documents that say that Egypt deployed and took control of those islands in January of 1950 uh, with the approval and agreement of the Saudi government. And th But at the same time, that, that document goes on to say that it is well within its rights to do so because it does fall within its territorial waters, as Gamal Abdel Nasser mentioned in the uh, introductory video. So it's just to say that the historical debate, uh, it doesn't, I mean, most like most historical debates, is not absolutely conclusive. There's room for disagreement. There's room for negotiation. The issue is really more the patriarchal manner and the condescending manner with which the state has approached this issue, where it tells the population, we know best trust us on this. They haven't really put forward compelling evidence to support their case uh, on this issue. Uh, when the controversy erupted initially after the announcement last year, Sisi basically just told the population, I don't want to hear about this issue again after he gave a very long speech about how he doesn't give any, he doesn't take anything that isn't his because his mother told him not to and whatnot. I mean, he gives these very patronizing speeches 
that, uh, that, are, that basically inflamed the controversy over this issue. And the way that the government has dealt with this has basically been treating the population as children that shouldn't be intervening in adult decisions like this. And that's really not uh, productive, it's not professional, and it's not proper governance. And that, that's where we see, a, I think, a bigger problem with this entire debate. Yeah, yeah, there also seems to be some sort of implication that a possible deal was made with uh, Saudi, or with Israel, ex excuse me, behind closed door because of the strategic area that these islands lie in. Are you hearing that? And if some deal has been made between Saudi Arabia and Israel, then that is very significant. What I care about as an Egyptian is that this has always been a sovereign or uh, a, a, a land that we, we have sovereignty of. And, uh, uh, and uh, let me just, you know, disagree with your guest uh, from, uh, from Cairo uh, about the, the, the fact that it, it's, it's been always a matter of contention between uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt. No. I mean, the, the whole thing started in 1970, uh, 1957, when King uh, Saud was visiting uh, uh, the uh, Washington and the U.S. president asked him personally to start challenging Egypt over the sovereignty because these two islands, which controls the, 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 the passage, the maritime passage in that bottleneck part of, of the Red Sea have always been a matter of concern for both Israel since its establishment in 1948 and uh, the United States. So uh, the United States started asking uh, the, the Saudi Arabia and the Saudi king, King Saud, uh, in, in, uh, back in 57 uh, to challenge Egypt over the sovereignty uh, on the sovereignty over the two islands. This is the real story, how this contention, so-called contention, so-called dispute started. But then, I mean, when, when Israel occupied these two islands, uh, all the Saudi claims supported by the Americans disappeared. So th 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 this shows that the, 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 the whole thing was just made up. Okay, then let's bring it back to, t to today. And again, I'll ask you my question about Israel because you were mentioning Israel. Mm -hmm. Was some sort of deal made now? And is that why Egypt is willing to give up, seemingly willing to give up these well, uh, I, islands I have, to Saudi I have Arabia? facts and figures and documents uh, uh, on, on many parts of this issue, but uh, uh, facts and figures and, and documents about a secret deal between uh, Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Israel, I have no such a thing. Uh, Timothy but okay. we hear reports and we hear some officials also from, from, from Israel, from Egypt, talking about something like that. But I don't have any documents, something to document this. Uh, Timothy, can you weigh in on the, on the Israel issue? I mean, it seems like Israel has quite a lot to gain if Saudi Arabia takes control of these islands. No, well, not really. I mean, look, so Israel's role in this is simply that uh, this wouldn't happen without their approval, right? Um, following the Camp David Agreement, Egypt wouldn't be able to allow Saudi to control that waterway uh, without Israel uh, giving the green light on that. And they did, and they've done so publicly, and Israeli officials have come out and said so. It's not, it's not a secret agreement. It's a public, it's a public uh, discussion. Um, so that, that, is, that is definitely the case. Uh, with respect to what does Israel stand to gain, realistically, nobody's shutting down that waterway. The Saudis aren't going to shut it down uh, and block Israel. The Egyptians aren't going to shut it down block Israel. Neither of them have particularly bad relations with Israel right now. Uh, there's, in Egypt, there's a lot of cooperation uh, over Sinai. Israel's been approving their operations there. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to conduct them because of the demilitarized zone. Uh, and with respect to Saudi, there's been a lot of overtures and back-channel discussions that have been increasingly uh, public. So. Neither of them have a lot of tension with Israel at this time, uh, which is part of the reason why Israel would be more comfortable approving uh, this transfer. And so they didn't, put, they didn't put forward any objection from what we understand. What is the real issue here, Yahya? What is the real issue behind why President Sisi wants to give these islands to Saudi Arabia? Well, I guess President Sisi is just executing the last stage of a long-term deal uh, that started back at the beginning of the uh, 90s. To be more specific, in 1990, when Mubarak issued that presidential decree uh, in which he designated the, the baseline according to which the, the, the territorial water of Egypt should be measured. So uh, instead of uh, going for the highest point on that sea, on the Red, Red Sea coastline, uh, stipulated as stipulated by the international law, 
to start measuring the, the, the Egypt's territorial water, he went for the lowest point on the, on the coastline. Instead of going to the highest point, which is Nap, the city of Nap, the town of Nap, he went to the lowest point, the city of Sharm el Sheikh. If you go to the lowest point and start measuring the territorial water, uh, if you do that against the international law, you're ejecting the two islands out of the Egypt's territorial water. If you abide by the international law and go to the highest point, then you go even way beyond the two islands as they have always been. So the whole thing started at the time of Mubarak, but it, the, it, Saudi Arabia, according to the international law, couldn't claim the two islands immediately after Egypt practically ejected them. They had to wait uh, for 20 years to set the baseline to measure their territorial water in order to invoke a clause in the international law, which right. is called the terra nullis. The terra nullis, it's the, the Latin for the, uh, the unclaimed territory, the islands. Okay, so uh, Saudi Arabia had to wait for 20 years to issue a degree with its baseline, which used, which in which he used the highest point. Okay, so wait, laser, so let me just get this straight. So you think that President Sisi is doing this just because he's continuing from a Mubarak uh, yeah, era it's, policies? It's, it's is that the reason? It's a previous old commitment from the time it's of Mubarak. It's a previous commitment. Timothy, do you agree with that? What could Sisi be getting in return for this, if anything at all? I mean, I'll be perfectly honest. Here. I'm not entirely familiar with the uh, with the uh, the demarcation that took place in the '90s that uh, is being referred to. Um, but with respect to what he could gain, I mean, the impression that a lot of people in the population here have is that this was the the transfer of the islands was announced in conjunction with a visit from King Salman last year, in which he announced uh, billions of dollars in investment and tens of billions of dollars in loans in uh, in different petrochemical products uh, over the course of five years. Um, and so a lot of Egyptians interpreted that to mean that he was selling these islands in some way or another uh, to the Saudi government. Of course, both parties insisted that's not the case. It is worth noting that as this, uh, as this legal controversy has, uh, has gotten deeper and deeper into the courts and uh, the Egyptian government has not been able to transfer the islands, that the, uh, that the loan in gas and, and petrol uh, has been suspended. Uh, it was suspended several months ago under the auspice, under the pretext that Saudi Arabia was reassessing its production because of the reduction that OPEC had agreed on. But a lot of people uh, have doubts that this was the, the main reason for it and believe it had more to do with the failure to deliver those islands, as well as other controversies that have existed between the Egyptian and Saudi government uh, over the years. But for domestic uh, Egyptian issues, I mean, this clearly is setting the legislative and judiciary on a collision course, isn't it, uh, Timothy? Um, and the presidency. Um, I think that Look, this is this is a situation right now. So the judiciary has already kind of staked out a position against uh, this agreement, or at least many high-ranking judges have. Um, in Parliament, it's actually controversial. Uh, it'll likely pass because the government has enough control over the parliamentary leadership to make it pass. But many parliamentarians have been uh, exceptionally vocal in criticizing this, when usually almost everything the government wants does pass Parliament. Uh, and so, I mean, we had Egyptian parliamentarians standing and chanting uh, Egyptian, Egyptian over again in reference to the islands uh, and trying to shout down basically uh, their opponents, uh, a scene I've never, I've never witnessed in the Egyptian parliament ever. Uh, so there's, there's definitely a, there's, there's a lot of tension even within the legislative body uh, over this uh, agreement and whether or not they should be even voting on it. Right. Yeah, yeah. For those who are opposing this, as uh, Timothy was saying, what do you think the next steps are for them? I mean, do, do you see any plans for them going forward in order for them to try and win this uh, battle in Parliament? Well, even if it didn't happen, even if it didn't happen, I believe that the Egyptians will never uh, abandon their two islands. And the, 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 that is something that actually uh, makes me scared. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to make such feud between the two nations, between the two countries. And I, I believe that even if the, the government and the regime managed to, uh, to give up the two islands 
uh, for, for Saudi Arabia, uh, there will be another confrontation with... What do you mean by that? A confrontation, uh, 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 a conflict, a political conflict in the future, uh, a physical conflict, nobody knows. But I'm sure that the, this generation and the next generation will never give up on these two islands. And well, we the suspicious seen, way, right. because it, it, it's not just suspicious. I mean, the whole thing have been done in a criminal way since the time of Mubarak. I mean, and it was done as a conspiracy in the dark and behind the back of the people, of the nation. Uh, why, why do you think, I mean, legally, they, 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 what they had back in April 2016 when they signed this draft uh, agreement, it was just a farce because they didn't need it. They, they needed not these, this, that, that, that uh, treaty because they, they, they had the, the presidential decree in Egypt, which actually decided upon the territorial water, the Egyptian territorial water, and the Saudis decided on their territorial water by the royal decree uh, issued in 2010. And that's it. I mean, that, that, that's all the two countries had okay, ha, to have. Back to your point to... on Egypt, and you're saying that Egyptians are not going to let this uh, go through. What are the possible scenarios going forward? Uh, I, I think uh, th there, will be, there will be some riots, and uh, the, the people are going to take to the streets against this thing. And even, even if it didn't happen, or if, if, if it happened, then they managed, as usual, to use force to quell it. Uh, I believe it's going to be a matter of serious dispute between the two countries. Uh, Timothy, give me your sense of what the, uh, uh, how this is going to play out, in fact, and what the, what the possible scenarios are going forward. Um, I don't know that this will result in mass protest. It certainly has caused some of the largest uh, political protests we've seen in years. Uh, I don't know that it'll cause uh, rioting or anything of that nature. Uh, the, the, the situation is that these are very difficult things to predict. A lot of people keep anticipating the next big uh, uprising and then it doesn't quite happen. Um, and people are, while very upset about this, are also, I think, even more upset and under more pressure when it comes to their economic situation. and. Uh, the exploding cost of, uh, of goods. Uh, inflation has finally come down to 30 percent, as though that's some sort of relief when it was, uh, it was peaking past 40 uh, not too long ago. And we're still uh, looking forward to another round of subsidy reductions that will push prices up again. Um, so there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of pressure that the population is under. This is one issue uh, that is particularly sensitive, undoubtedly, and that the, it, it deeply undermines the credibility of the president, it deeply undermines the credibility of the government in the eyes of many Egyptians. That that's undoubted. That's that's beyond doubt. All right, Yahya, yeah, yeah, just final words for you. And let me ask you this because reports coming through say, I mean, this is actually according to a government report advising Parliament on the terms of this particular agreement, that Egypt will keep administrative control over the two islands, even though their ownership will be transferred to Saudi Arabia. Do you understand how that would work? No. All right. And for me, it's meaningless. This is something that is being said just to appease to the feelings of the Egyptians because it will never happen once they transfer control and sovereignty uh, uh, over the two islands to Saudi Arabia. They're gone. But my personal prediction, they are not going to be gone forever. Uh, Timothy, go on. Just, there is one like uh, there is one material implication for that. I mean, I think it won't, on one level it's to appease the population to say we still we still control these islands. Uh, but part of the agreement in terms of the transfer is uh, distributing the re revenue of any possible gas fields that are found, uh, in which I believe Saudi Arabia would receive seventy five percent of the revenue and Egypt would receive twenty five percent. So if each, if that if the agreement remains that Saudi owns that territory, and then that would mean that the uh, agreement around the distribution of that revenue would, would follow those terms. Uh, and so that's the significance for Saudi Arabia, even under this compromise. Um, Got it. Undoubtedly, I mean, from the perspective of the... Uh, yep. Got it. Thank you, Timothy. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much uh, for joining us, uh, Yahya Ghanem and Timothy Kaldas. And uh, thank you for watching. You can see this program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. You can go for further discussion to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From myself and the whole team here in Doha, goodbye for now.